Hi, welcome to the analysis.news. I'm Paul Jay. In a few seconds, we'll be back with Bob Poland to discuss the Biden mansion bill that uh, hopes or says it's going to address the climate crisis. Uh, don't forget, we have a donate button. If, we can't, if you don't give, we can't do this. Uh, but most importantly, get to the website and sign up for our email list. As reported in The Guardian, the bulk of the Biden Mansion Inflation Reduction Act, as it's called, which contains around $369 billion to combat climate change, allows for large tax credits for clean energy, such as solar and wind power, to allow such projects to go ahead on a grand scale, The Guardian says. States and utilities will also get $30 billion to help the transition to renewable zero-carbon electricity. A new $27 billion clean energy technology accelerator will be created to help advance renewable technologies. $3 billion will be given to the U.S. Postal Service to electrify its fleet of trucks. And there will be a new program to drive down leaks of methane, a potent greenhouse gas from oil and gas drilling operations. A further $20 billion will be spent to pr promote climate-friendly agricultural practices and another $5 billion to make American forests better prepared for the wildfires that increasingly threaten them due to global heating. There is also a $9 billion scheme focused on low-income households to electrify home appliances and make dwellings more energy efficient. Further tax credits spread out over the next decade will make it easier to buy heat pumps, rooftop, solar, and water heaters. Disadvantaged communities that suffer the brunt of fossil fuel pollution have all also been recognized with $60 billion dedicated to environmental justice projects across the U.S. The bill doesn't include any mechanism to specifically phase out fossil fuels, the primary cause of the climate crisis, and indeed looks to lock in their use for decades to come due to a compromise struck with Manchin. Under the deal, regulations around drilling will be loosened and new leases will be offered in places such as the Gulf of Mexico and Alaska. Environmentalists have called this arrangement, quote, a climate suicide pact. The bill is expected by both its authors and some independent analysts to allow the U.S. to cut its emissions by 40 percent by 2030, based on 2005 levels. This, they say, brings the U.S. close to Biden's goal of slashing emissions in half this decade, which scientists have said is imperative if the world is to avoid catastrophic climate change. Again, that's from The Guardian. Now joining us to assess the Inflation Reduction Act is Bob Poland. He's the co-founder and director of the Perry Institute at University of Massachusetts, Amherst. He's the author with Noam Chomsky of Climate Change and the Global Green New Deal. So, Bob, there's three main areas of the bill I think we should talk about. One, does it really have anything to do with lowering inflation? Two, what happened with all the taxes on the rich Biden had promised? And three, and let's start with, and perhaps the most important issue, does it address the climate crisis? Is the bill in category A, far from what's needed? B, better than nothing? C, actually could be good? D, all of the above? What do you think, Bob? D, D. all of the above. Yeah, I, fi I figured you'd go there. <laughs> All right. Okay. Go ahead. Why? Yeah. Well, a. Well, I. I okay. We can't keep doing the same number. <laughs> it's it's definitely better. Way way better than nothing. And two weeks ago, we thought we had nothing. Uh, which talking about the climate catastrophe that you just quoted, we were certainly on a track to climate catastrophe as of two weeks ago when Mansion, at least according to reports, walked away from any agreement. What we have now is a significant uh, intervention. It, I, I mean, it is certainly not adequate, and all the problems you just mentioned are uh, certainly incorporated into it, including especially what you said about um, allowing for fossil fuel development, in fact, encouraging and supporting it, concurrent with these clean energy investments. Uh, the level of clean energy investments, as you said, 
uh, in the range of forty billion dollars in public funding. Uh, you know, according to my own estimates, what we really need to hit the twenty thirty emission reduction target at fifty percent is in the range of four hundred billion a year. So we're at around ten percent of that. Hold on, you just said four hundred billion. R- right. How so about- the bill, the bill. Uh, uh, allocates. Oh, hold on. 40- okay. Just to be clear. Okay. Maybe you could say, just remind us the bill's over 10 years. You're saying it should be that much each, every year. The bill uh, is, yeah, is at roughly 400 billion for 10 years. So divide by 10, that's about 40 billion per year. Uh, according to my own work, we need in the range of 400 billion per year to build a clean energy infrastructure that will enable us to get to a roughly 50% emission reduction. So this bill would get us about 10% of the way through public spending. Now we could get to 400 billion a year through leveraging that 40 billion with private investments. Uh, you know, my own estimate, conservative estimate is this bill would get us uh, up to about a hundred billion total, including public plus private, through the tax credits and the loan guarantees for private capitalists. Um, so we're still about likely about seventy five percent less than what where we need to be. We're about twenty five percent of the way. The way that we could do to get all the way there is through organizing and getting state governments, municipal governments, institutions to insist. I like my own institution, University of Massachusetts, is committed to be zero emissions by 2032. Uh, If private institutions say, hey, you know what? We're not buying any more oil, gas, and coal. Just not doing it. Uh, We can get there. Uh, And this bill helps. Uh, but it certainly does not provide on its own sufficient resources to get to that level. Now, in previous conversations we've had about the Biden plans, uh, both from when he was campaigning and, and, and even that Build Back Better bill, which is uh, dead now, um, there was a heavy reliance on carbon capture uh, and, and supposedly clean carbon technology which more or less doesn't exist or, or, or doesn't exist at a scale that's going to be meaningful. I, I, I can't tell, is this, is, is this money going at all to the clean carbon kind of idea or is it, is it really focused on sustainable energy like wind and solar and such? So if you read through the details of the bill, like I've done, um, the, the, uh, the explicit allocation for carbon capture is relatively modest. It's about um, 300 and something uh, million per year. Uh, so it's less than 1%. Um, on the other hand, there are these broad categories called clean electricity and clean fuels. And so it's still up in the air, the extent to which those general categories, clean electricity, will incorporate support for carbon capture. Given that, you know, the grand deal, the grand deal that made this all happen was Manchin insisted that the, uh, the, the Biden administration support the uh, d- development of this uh, natural gas pipeline through West Virginia. Uh, the so-called Mountain Valley Pipeline. I mean, that's if, you know, that's going to build in fossil fuel production development for decades. I mean, why bother to build the pipeline if you're not going to use it? And so that therefore, if we're building in uh, increased fossil fuel production, therefore, if we're going to get anywhere close to these emission targets, we have to increase carbon capture. I'm not in favor of carbon capture. And as you said, there's no evidence that we can produce carbon capture commercially, even if you liked it. Uh, But that has to be 
a big part of the bill, even though in its current uh, definition, these specified programs, the extent of funding for carbon capture is relatively modest. On the other hand, the extent of support for nuclear is quite large. So nuclear is a big part of this bill. And what do you think of that? Well, I'm against it. Uh, I, you know, there's debates even on the left as to how much we need to rely on nuclear. I don't see it. Uh, other people, such as, you know, the great climate scientist James Hansen is saying we cannot get to a climate uh, stabilization path without depending primarily on nuclear as the alternative. I think that courts all kinds of dangerous, disastrous prospects um, including all the issues around radioactivity, including the issues around uh, safety and uh, political uh, uh, takeovers like like what we just have seen in Ukraine. Where did, where did the Russian forces go like in the first week? They went to Chernobyl. They went to the other site, which I can't pronounce, Zabotorista, the biggest nu- nuclear site in Europe. And they took it over. Now, what were they going to do with it? Uh, you know, of course, that remained an open question. So I don't see nuclear. I see nuclear as maybe a subsidiary uh, to a, a overall renewable founded, uh, renewable dominant alternative energy system that could be constructed through this bill. But we really have to fight for it because as it is, Nuclear is a big part of the of the overall story. Carbon capture is likely to be. Um, so uh, solar wind are definitely there, uh, but we need to really push to advance those relative to nuclear and carbon capture. And I, I, I've also understood, even if one was in favor of nuclear, uh, it's highly unlikely it could be a significant factor within seven, eight, nine years, it just takes a lot longer to finance and build these things. And something radical has to happen in seven, eight, nine years. Uh, we're all ready. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So we have, even on costs, uh, carbon capture, first of all, there's no large scale commercial operation of carbon capture at all anywhere in the world, despite decades of trying. Of course, why wouldn't they try? Because this is the way that the fossil fuel industry thinks it can survive. Okay, so that's carbon capture. Nuclear, uh, yeah, costs have gone up uh, and continue to rise. Yes, that's largely due to building in uh, safety measures. And, you know, the uh, proponents of nuclear saying, oh, these safety measures, they're excessive. Well, really, I don't think so. Uh, You know, especially if we're talking about, you know, the new idea is smaller scale modular nuclear plants. Well, that seems to me is only going to increase the risks associated with nuclear because there's going to be smaller ones spread out more and that therefore uh, all of the issues with respect to uh, making them operate safely, guarding them and so forth, just get dispersed, not constantly. This is the plan plan Bill Gates is uh, promoting. Yeah, Bill Gates, among others. But yes, so... uh, and, and meanwhile, the costs of uh, solar and wind are falling dramatically. The costs of solar uh, per unit of uh, electricity have come down almost 90% in a decade. I mean, this is remarkable. So whatever else one may say about solar and wind, at this point, they are the low cost alternative for electricity generation globally. They, they are so long as this tension with China doesn't break out to an even more uh, of a trade war, given how dependent the world is on Chinese solar. Yeah. I mean, if we want to say, yeah, how did so- how did solar come down 90 percent in a decade? To summarize it in one word, China. Uh, they're the ones that are producing the cheap panels. Now, of course, we could do it in the U.S. We just have it. So maybe the bill, the subsidies that are built into this bill will accelerate you know, U.S. development to a significant extent. That would be fine. Uh, We should be competing. We should be in other places as well. So when when I gave you the door A, door B, et cetera, um, and you picked all of of the above, 
uh, all the things that I listed in that list of things where money is going to go, I mean, it all mostly sounds good. Uh, but if but but the but's a pretty big but. If you're not actually phasing out fossil fuel, and in fact you're you're opening doors to more fossil fuel, then is this actually in the end okay? It's nice, but given we're facing existential crisis, is it kind of window dressing that allows Biden to say uh, he's done something when he's not really facing up to the the, the scale of the crisis? Well, I mean. Let's look at political reality today. There'd be no bill without Mansion or Cinema. Cinema wanted the tax cuts on rich people eliminated. Mansion wanted the pipeline for West Virginia. And Mansion, I mean, my understanding, reading the tea leaves, Mansion waited to the last possible moment moment to support anything because after their Congress is going on break next week. They won't come back till September, and then they're all running for office. So this was it. And he really wanted that pipeline. So this was his uh, bargaining chip. He'll support a bill as long as he gets his pipeline for West Virginia, which, of course, at least logically, builds in fossil fuel production and distribution for decades, um, including fracking, of course. Uh and so that's what we have. Uh, what did, what was Biden supposed to do? I don't know. Get more votes, but that would you know. Do we know that what's going to happen in November? So the real thing, my you know, having thought about it, you know, again, I think this is way better than nothing. This is real money. You know, this is hundreds of billions of dollars, and then we have to uh, mobilize around. You know, we can stop. We can stop fossil fuel. Uh, consumption just by saying we stop fossil fuel consumption. So like my university says, zero, we're going to zero. Private institutions, municipalities, states can vote in uh, regulations. If you build in these regulations at the state level and we can force the fossil fuel companies to maybe obey the law, um, that's the way through which we can build on this, let's say, mediocre bill. Not terrible mediocre and move towards a real solution. Um, now, in terms of the money that that's going towards sustainable energy, uh, what, what do you get a sense of what that really means? What, what are these subsidies? Well, OK, so, uh, you know, this study that that myself and my co-workers put out yesterday uh, we divide up all the pro every single program, every single detailed program within the bill. And people can find this on the website of Perry Institute, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, as far as I know, it's the only uh, study out that has estimated the employment impacts of this bill. Um, so uh, we divide the programs into ones in which there's only government spending, ones that are effectively that are subsidies for private spending, including corporate investments, but also consumers to buy heat pumps or electric vehicles. And then third, loan guarantees, which are also subsidies for private banks to make green loans. So um, if we if we think about those three different categories, you know, the, the subsidies are there to for private private businesses, building owners, including homeowners, people who are buying cars. So so there there is a good chunk of money, you know. So there's $7,500 for anyone that wants to buy an electric vehicle. Electric vehicles cost, I don't know, about $30,000, $35,000. So that is a substantial subsidy for private people. Now, people argue, well, uh, it's still too much. You know, most people are still not going to spend the money on an electric vehicle. Or you have to change how electricity, you also have to change how electricity is being generated. Because if you're plugging your car and the electricity is coming from coal. <laughs> right. So those things have to happen in combination. So that's why at the state level, if we can insist that the, uh, uh, that the utilities 
uh, keep increasing their share of renewable electricity, then we're okay. Now, it may be that the uh, utilities are going to like look at the same studies that I look at and see that, you know what? Investments in green energy are, are good for us because they're cheaper than generating electricity through coal. Uh, they're more or less at parity with, with fracking. Uh, so, but the, you know, with fracking and regulations, they're better off, better off building capacity, new capacity with solar and wind. So, uh, that's the things around which I think, you know, labor and, and environmental activists need to organize and make this really, really clear. I think something, you, the, a word you keep mentioning is, is kind of the critical piece of all this. And to some extent, it's going to come down to whether if this isn't done, human society as we know it isn't going to be around for a, in a few decades. You said at the state level, and I, it seems to me the federal politics is, is so paralyzed. Uh, this bill is, like you say, better than nothing. But if there's no actual phasing out of fossil fuel, you know, if just based on what I understand of the science, there's no way of reaching any significant targets from this bill. But if the big states like New York and California, maybe Illinois, I mean, states with big cities, essentially that vote for Democrats, but also might vote for progressive Democrats that actually get serious about climate, because a lot of the corporate Democrats, and I don't even mean as far right as Manchin, aren't serious about taking on the fossil fuel companies. And Biden clearly never has been. But if this doesn't happen at the state levels, then I think we're screwed. But maybe it could happen at the state level because because, you know, some of these big states could do something significant and maybe even put some pressure on the smaller fossil fuel states. Well, I mean, let's just think about California, which is roughly 15 percent of U.S. GDP. Uh, and even more, if we think about, say, the market for cars and the market for electric heat pumps, if they uh, build in regulations uh, which require, uh, you know, no more, uh, no more sales of uh, fossil fuel uh, powered cars, uh, no more uh, conventional air conditioning or uh, conventional heating and, and uh, cooling and ventilating systems, uh, alternative electric heat pumps. If they if they establish regulations along those lines then the manufacturers, they're going to build for the California market and they're going to build for the New York market, as was the case um, when, you know, California first set their um, uh, their efficiency standards for fossil fuel based cars. And that then transformed the market for, you know, that then ushered in this era of hybrids and much more efficient cars. Yes, uh, fossil fuel generated powered cars. But so, I mean, this this bill, like I said, it's not nothing. It is real money. And on top of it, if these, you know, major democratic controlled states and municipalities really uh, establish stringent regulations and further support for the clean investments. So, for example, uh, this bill gives you seventy five hundred dollars if you're going to buy an electric vehicle. What if California tax on another 5,000? Uh, that will certainly, you know, give a lot of impetus for purchases in, you know, California, which is 15% of the whole economy. So the, that's the kind of dynamic. And on top of that, if we think about our institutions that we have some control over, such as universities, religious institutions, if the big universities one by one do what my university has done, under the enlightened leadership of our current chancellor, uh, Subhaswamy, um, if we insist that, you know, do what it takes, we're going to be at zero by 2032. I was at the meeting when our chancellor told the committee that I was on students, faculty, administrators, bureaucrats, and they, of course, were people were telling him it's too expensive, da, 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 we can't do it, it's complicated, but the students, fought for a, you know, serious commitment and firm commitment and the chancellor backed them. And so here we are. It's a good thing, but it's not going to deal with the... 
Of course, it's one place. So, but, so at the you know, at the state level, if if just even New York and California started to yeah. pass, they can pass legislation to phase out fossil fuel, can't they? It doesn't have yeah. to happen at the federal level. They have, yeah, they can. And New York, California, as you said, Illinois. Uh, so now you're at something like 25% of the economy. Uh, yeah, that would be really uh, foundational. It would establish this framework which can use the this bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, um, so-called. Uh, uh, but that's really, we, we certainly don't want to sneeze at, at, you know, 30, $35 billion a year in available funds. It's not enough, but it's certainly not nothing. Now the, uh, before we just move quickly to the other two categories to talk about in terms of this bill, uh, you've, you've done some modeling, uh, there's, you know, a lot of talk, you know, what will happen to employment and so on. Uh, you've actually done some work on what the employment consequences of this bill will be. What, what did you find? Yep. Myself and co-authors, uh, Sharad Lala and Shovik Chakraborty did a, you know, lightning fast study that went out yesterday. We started it four days ago. Uh, we modeled every single item in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and overall, what we came out is that the bill... Uh, if we factor in conservatively private spending uh, induced by the by this forty billion roughly, we're at we're at a little less than a hundred billion uh, per year overall in spending, and that we estimate is going to generate about nine hundred thousand jobs. So that's again not it's not huge, but you know we our labor force is one hundred and sixty four million, so this is about zero point six percent. Uh, injection of new employment into the U.S. labor force. So it's certainly pushing in the right direction. And, you know, I've had some discussions with members of the press, mainstream press already, in which they say, wow, what a great idea that uh, a climate uh, program could actually be good for jobs. Well, that's always been true, but uh, it's good to see that it's catching on uh, yeah, somebody somebody said what you said was a paradigm shift and you said I've been, paradigm say, shift. I've been saying this That's for 15 it. years yeah well yeah but I mean that you know so yes this particular journalist said well think about this in terms of Ohio where you have this right-wing Trump guy Vance running for Senate who's saying you know these these, these green uh, projects are you know job killers. And we need to defend what we have in terms of fossil fuel industry. Well, I already did a study on Ohio, I don't know, two years ago, showing that the green investments are far more supportive of job creation and economic opportunity than any kind of uh, program to protect fossil fuel jobs. But I mean, yes, this certainly fits within that framework. And let me just say again, because I think it's so important, uh, the, the idea that the Senate is paralyzing climate policy essentially because Republicans, due to the uh, freaky American system that gets two senators to every state, no matter what size it is, uh, and a, a stupid thing called the Electoral College, that in fact isn't really paralyzing everything because the states that could take significant action are essentially controlled by Democrats. So in many ways, the actual fight is with corporate Democrats who run those states and could have been doing so much more and aren't. Well, yeah, so we're, you know, we have to recognize that all 50 Republicans, it's just a given that we can't get a single Republican from any state to support any, any semblance of this kind of measure, even uh, this kind of, relatively weak measure that we've got now. Uh, if if we had one or two Democrats, then we wouldn't care. We wouldn't care about Joe Manchin. No one ever would have ever heard of him. Uh, but it's only because there is not a single Republican, which was not true uh, not that long ago. You know, uh, when, when um, McCain was running for president in 2008, he had, a, he had a climate provision in his overall platform. It wasn't that good, but he was acknowledging the importance of doing something. 
Now you can't get a single one to do it. Even Newt Gingrich acknowledged it about 12 years, 13 years ago or something. But yeah. Not anymore. Right. Uh, so, uh, well, let's, be, before we end here, let's just finish talking about the bill. Um, first of all, why on earth is it called the anti-inflation? I mean, it's what, it, what the hell has this bill even got to do with inflation? Independent of all the climate stuff, there are two provisions that we could say are uh, uh, consistent with dampening increased prices. Uh, number one is all the healthcare stuff, which is very, very modest. Relative to the climate stuff, it's even more modest. The one thing that may be relatively significant over time is the uh, capacity of the government to bargain with pharmaceutical companies over the prices of, of prescription drugs. So if that were in, integrated, incorporated, that would put some downward pressure on prices over time. It's not going to have anything to do with inflation today. Zero. Um, and then this idea of, of reducing the federal deficit, uh, again, maybe this, uh, uh, almost nothing uh, in terms of uh, weakening demand in the economy, which then puts some very, very modest downward pressure on prices. You could say favorably that, oh, we're building in a green uh, uh, infrastructure, green energy infrastructure, and Green energy is not cheaper than fossil fuels. So that becomes anti-inflationary. So all of these things, you could say, have some uh, uh, anti-inflationary components that could work themselves out over the next five, six, seven years. They're not going to have anything to do with the current bout of high inflation. Which has to do with high energy costs, supply chain issues and have absolutely nothing to do with the size of the American deficit. And it's kind of a joke because, you know, the more the crisis is, the higher the American dollar goes. Keep, everyone keeps buying American dollars. So this idea that somehow, oh, no one's going to have faith in the dollar. Our debt's too big. I mean, it's just ridiculous. The dollar's never, I don't know if it's, you know, the more, the more, the more Russia invades Ukraine, the more people want U.S. dollars. On top of that, uh, let, and we've talked about this before. I mean, if we say that a, a part, maybe a third of the inflationary pressures is coming from modest wage increases, well, that's favorable. We want that. Workers deserve raises and the raises should be higher than the rate of inflation so that they bring home more money, more purchasing power. Uh, that hasn't happened because in addition to the wage increases, We've also had, as you said, the supply chain uh, shortages, which have driven up prices, the monopolistic power of oil companies and other uh, other big corporations along the supply chain. And so that's driven up inflation, you know, double the rate of wage increases. A lot of the, all these tax uh, increases that Biden had said uh, he was going to bring in on the rich. Uh, he had to give up on all of them, or I don't know how, <laughs> if he was all that reluctant to give up on them, but he did under ma presser, pressure of Manchin. Um, I, I personally wouldn't mind giving up on the tax increases if there was a far stronger climate bill. You know, if, if you want to bribe the rich to go along with phasing out fossil fuel, okay, for for a few more years, bribe the rich. But but they didn't phase out fossil fuel. Well, the other way that the rich are getting bribed uh, is, of course, all of the uh, incent tax incentives, tax credits, loan guarantees to build the green economy will be basically a, a, a very high proportion of that will go to rich people who are investors. Um, so, you know, we're in a capitalist economy and that's kind of the reality. It would be great if it were otherwise, but that's not where we are. Well, uh, but that's part of the problem. If you're not, you don't phase out fossil fuel and you do all the other stuff, it's good, except it becomes a boon, you know, a boon or boom for finance who are going to financialize the way all of this gets done. I, I just think it's very important to keep stressing the lack of the phasing out of fossil fuel and stress again the, the role states can play 
in doing this because it doesn't have to be hopeless. If you're in a state where the Democrats control it, then your fight is with corporate Democrats that won't take this kind of climate action. And then, you know, they can keep blaming the Republicans, but you can't blame the Republicans in states where the Republicans can barely get elected. And then there's another, right. there's another thing coming, you know, the, the, it's very possible and likely the way things are going that the Republicans. And when we say Republicans now, to a large extent, we have to say Christian nationalists. It's a real far right that's going to take over at least one house, if not both houses of Congress in 2022. They might end up with the presidency in 24. They more or less have the Supreme, not more or less, they have the Supreme Court. So this federal government controlled perhaps by very rabid right-wing forces are really going to come into contradiction with the populations, especially in the big states, like in New York, like in California, like in Illinois, and a few others. You know, people living in those states and, and other states where, where progressives and in the broadest sense of the term, they better start thinking about what this country is going to look like. Because if, they, if the states don't step up, the ones that don't want to live under a, a Christian theocracy, climate science deniers, it's up to these states uh, to do it. Well, I mean, I think, you know, having been involved in, in both New York and in California, um, I think there, you know, there's a very robust movement, uh, alliances between environmentalists and labor, which I think is the core of accomplishing exactly what you're talking about. And I think they're doing well. For example, in California, the even the Oil Refineries Workers Union has endorsed a very aggressive green transition program. There are only one union, but I mean, that's really significant. Oil refinery workers who make very good uh, standard of living by through the fossil fuel industry. And they are, you know, it is they recognize that we have to make a transition. They have to be supported through the transition. So it's those kinds of measures supporting a transition for people who and communities that are dependent on the fossil fuel industry, I think that will shift the tide in these states. Colorado is another one, uh, which is kind of in between, uh, which has a pretty robust fossil fuel industry, uh, but they're willing to support uh, a, a transition to a green economy if it includes support for workers and communities that are currently fossil fuel dependent. And that the, even that's another thing that could be fought at a state level, because if a California and New York got together and said to fossil fuel states, you know, if even if the federal government won't fund a just, just transition, we will. I mean, California and New York got a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I agree that, you know, working at the state level is really critical. Uh, that said, I think that, you know, this bill, if it passes, the good parts are helpful. The bad parts are really awful. And so we have to work on minimizing the negative impact of the bad parts. All right. Great. Well, thanks very much, Bob. OK, great. Thank you for having me on. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news. And please don't forget your donations. Keep us going and get on the email list. Uh, thanks again.